Buddhism is not uh, just meditation. In other words, if you do meditation, that's wonderful. I'm very happy that you do meditation. If that's all you do, well then you're not doing Buddhism. If you follow the precepts, you are following the teaching of the Buddha, and when somebody becomes a Buddhist, officially becomes a Buddhist, they do two things. One, they take refuge. And they take a ref think of refuge. It's a wonderful word because you always have to explain it to people. Because it's not an, we, we don't use that as an everyday thing. But if you take refuge, you come in out of the rain. If it's raining a lot outside and you find a roof that you can get underneath and you can shelter. So refuge is a kind of shelter. And you take refuge in the Buddha. That extraordinary man who taught the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and how to live a life that is not full of unhappiness <coughs> and discontent and suffering. And that is what he did. I used to have a friend and a teacher who tried to teach me Vietnamese. After two years, he realized it was a completely lost cause, and he gave up. But um, he used to say that the Buddha will always be special. I never worried about the Buddha being special, but he used to say the Buddha was special because he was the first and I got my National Geographic magazine two or three days ago, and their subject is the Himalayas. And Hillary was the first. Lots of people have gone to the top of the Himalayas now, but there'll always be a first. And, and Hillary was the man that got to the top with some pretty lousy equipment, but still, he was the first. And the Buddha was the first that taught the Dharma, the second of the three treasures. And Dharma is an old, old Sanskrit word that means truth. Literally, it means truth. So we, when we talk about the Buddha's teaching, we talk about he taught the truth. And the Buddha had said repeatedly, and on his deathbed, he said, I hide nothing. There are no secrets that I'm keeping. Everything that you need to know, I've said. And on his deathbed, his, one of his disciples said, who will lead us now? And he said, the truth will lead you. The Dharma will lead you. You follow my teaching, everything will be fine. And one of his teachings was, don't believe it just because I said it. And we as human beings, we like to believe things because a very important person said them. You know, I can't imagine Mohandas Gandhi ever lying to anyone. Yet I'm sure Mohandas Gandhi would say, you need to look at what I say, not just accept what I say, but look at what I say and see if it's true. And that's the way the Buddha was. And he had a group of disciples around him, and when he died, there were literally thousands if the sutras are to be believed. But the old sutras, the middle sutras, the new sutras, they all say the same thing. That when he went into Anku, the summer training period, the rain season, when there's monsoon, and it's all across Asia, it's a wonderful time in Vietnam because you think you're going to drown. You walk outside, there's so much water. It's like someone's taking a bucket and throwing it on you. And it's when everything grows. And it's when the rivers swell up. It's when the Mekong is full. And when he would stop for the summer training period, he'd have 500 students, 700 students, 1,000, 1,200. They were recorded in the sutras. So we know he had a lot of monks. And he told them, your job is to spread the Dharma. Years ago, I gave a talk over at uh, Victor, or not Victor, but at uh, Barstow College when I was first up here. And uh, someone I knew was uh, dating a philosophy teacher over there. 
and she said, would you come and talk about Buddhism to his philosophy class? And I did. And I went over and I said, in, in my talk, I said, one of the distinctive things about Buddhism is we don't proselytize. Proselytize is, you know proselytize, think of Jehovah Witness. Seven o'clock on Saturday, you're trying to sleep. It's the only day you get to sleep and they're banging on the door and they say, do you believe? If you don't believe, let me tell you what you should believe. That's proselytizing. Buddhism never has proselytized. Now you come to a temple like this, I get to tell you. I get to talk. But if we meet in the street, I say, how are you? How are your children? Is your car running okay now? Oh, I like your new hairdo. See you again, I hope. We don't talk Buddhism. Now, if you say, you know, last Sunday I saw you and you said this thing and I've thought about it all week. Can you explain it better? Then I will talk about Buddhism. We don't proselytize. And in the Buddhist time, the monks would travel from town to town. And the towns were eight to 10 miles apart. It's how long they could, how, how far they could walk in an afternoon. They all had lunch together around 11 o'clock. Maybe the Buddha give a little talk, he'd say, go. And they would go from village to village. When I was in Vietnam, the first time I ever saw monks, they were in a little temple a fourth this size. If you can imagine something only a fourth this size. They had a Buddha statue, they had an incense burner, they had candles. One monk, he sat there and he read from the sutra. And people would come up to the door because it was only about, oh, maybe eight or ten feet deep. It was wide and shallow. And he would read the sutras. And maybe they didn't read. Maybe they couldn't understand writing. So he would read it to them. And another monk would go around like Hmong, every week Hmong now. He's the first monk I ever had that did this. He comes up here and he dusts. At least every week he'll tell me, oh, I, I have to go clean the altar. The Buddha's getting dusty. <laughs> and he'd come up and dust. The other monk would go around. He'd offer incense. And I came there and I bought some incense from the house next door and offered incense. And of course, they were kind of amazed because of who I was. They're the Sangha. Now, I want you to, if you've pictured this, here's a monk. He's sitting down on the floor. He's reading a sutra. People are coming up, they're listening for a while, and they're leaving. Some are staying a long time. That's Buddhism. You can come and you can listen. You can leave whenever you want to leave. Don't jump up now. <laughs> I'm not telling you to get up and leave right now. We got lunch waiting for us. But when, when the monks went into Egypt, they were called the silent ones. Egypt at that time was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of different beliefs, multi gods, all kinds of things going on. And the monks went there and they got a little place to live. And they sat in that little place and they waited for people to come and say, what are you? What are you about? What are you, what are you here for? What do you teach? And they go, aha, you walked through my door. Now I can tell you these things. That's the Sangha. I've told this story in any number of times that one summer training in Los Angeles with my teacher, there were probably 15 or 20 of us. And he said to them, which is the most important, the Buddha, the Dharma, or the Sangha? Now, to become a Buddhist, officially, you would get up in front of everybody and you would say, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I go to the Buddha for shelter, I go to the Dharma for shelter, I go to the Sangha for shelter. I have finished going to the Buddha, I have finished going to the 
Dharma, I have finished going to the Sangha. And the magic, magically, you are a Buddhist. But then that old monk, he says, wait, wait, there's more to this than you know. You have some precepts I would like you to keep. And I, my teacher, Thich Thien, used to say, if you can only keep one, then keep that one. If you can only keep two, keep the two. And he would go down through them. But if you can try to keep all five, keep all five. Don't take life. Don't say things that harm people. Sometimes that's translated as don't lie. That's not a good translation. Don't say things that will harm people. Don't take things that don't belong to you. No theft. No improper sexual conduct. He always used do not commit adultery. But no improper sexual conduct of any kind. In other words, no abuse of people. What's the matter? Call on. Don't worry about it. And then finally he said, don't drink intoxicants. To try to practice that is the truth to be a Buddhist. It is a technique. And the technique is to reflect upon these things every day. He also gave us another powerful tool. And that powerful tool in the very beginning was meditation. Because through meditation, you can see who you are. If you think you know who you are, you're already mistaken. And then later, other powerful tools before he died were instituted. Chanting is one of them. He instituted the ceremonies that we have. When I was young, I used to think this was something that people did. But many years after he died, people came along and said, oh, we ought to have a big celebration. Let's have some fireworks, and we'll have good food. And hey, let's go say the Buddha's name a lot. And, but reality is, with the exception of his birthday, I don't think they, they baked a cake for the Buddha. But we know Vulan which is probably the single most important celebration was instituted by the Buddha to bring relief to those that are suffering in places we like to call hell. But hell is a condition, it's not a place. And this meditation he gave, he didn't really ask them many questions or anything because most of the people that came to him, they led a very arduous life. But then Buddhism traveled to China. And people in China have a hard head. Yeah, they have a little difficulty looking sincerely and truly at themselves. They assume they know. And so the first monk in China said, who are you? Now, you probably think that question was, tell me your name. And you might possibly think it means, tell me your name and where you live. And you may also think it means, tell me your name, where you live, what ethnic nationality you are, and what kind of car do you drive. And it's none of those things. When the great master Bodhidharma said, who are you? He was asking who you were. And if you answered, I don't know, that was a good answer. Because he had a stick. I don't have my stick up here. But he had a stick. He always had a stick. And if you said, well, I'm Bob, bam, he'd hit you. <laughs> and if you went in there and you said, well, I'm a professor. I have many college degrees. Whap! He'd hit you. He said, no, I ask, who are you? In the beginning, koans, and the trans, koan is a, is a Japanese word. Kongan is a Chinese word. I don't know the Vietnamese word. Somebody will call it out for me before this is over with. I don't know the Korean word. It's like wahe or wuhe. Wahu. Say it loud. Wahu. Watu. Okay. I knew it, but I wasn't sure. Watu. Yeah. 
solve these problems. And the Zen teacher said, who are you? And people got used to that. And they'd come in and they'd go, ah! And the master would go, hmm, I think maybe you know who you are. Maybe you know, but maybe not. So then he said, what did your face look like before you were born? Oh, the monk doesn't know. The monk scratches his head. And it went on like that. The answer to the question is irrelevant. One of the most famous koans, which means public case. <coughs> Don't ask me why it means public case, but that's what it means. In the beginning, none of these were written down. By the time Dogen Zenji, the great Japanese master that took the Kaodong school from China to Japan, he took a book with him, and the book was called The Blue Cliff Record. And it was a collection of these stories of master, disciple, what they said to each other. Maybe it said uh, how the, the disciple demonstrated he was enlightened. The most famous is about a monk named Chao Chu. In Japan, it's Joshu. Let's see if we know. In Korean, it's. Hua Chu. Hua Chu. Well, that's the koan. Okay, so here he is, and he's an older monk. He's been a monk a long time. He's done many of these problems with his master. The master has said, okay, you're done. All right, the cake is baked. You understand. You know who Buddha is. You know who you are. You know your Buddha nature. Nobody can trick you. So he would travel from temple to temple, and he was in his 80s at this time. He lived to be 120. And he would travel and give talks, and he would lead meditation. He would teach the Dharma. And there was a young monk there, kind of like this one here. Pretty young. He just turned 50, by the way. <laughs> he's under the illusion he's old. <laughs> but we know better. And a young monk came up, and there was a puppy, a little dog, a little baby dog. And it was down at the feet of, of the master, Chao Chu. Now, I have to tell you, aside why they had a puppy dog. They had a puppy dog because in China they could not kill things. They were vegetarian. And so if a puppy was not needed, they didn't want the puppy dog, too many dogs, they would take it to the monastery, to the temple, and they would leave it at the front door. And they did this with, if you had a cow, if you had a moo cow that could not give milk anymore, they would take the cow and tie it up at the front of the temple. And if you had a horse you couldn't ride anymore, they took the horse and they tied it up at the front of the temple. And books tell us that long time ago in China, in the back of the temple were all of these animals. And the monks had to go bake food for the animals. I need some hay, sir, to feed our cow. What are you doing with a cow? Well, they didn't want to kill the cow, so they brought the cow to the temple. So how did the puppy dog get there? Somebody snuck up, left it one night. And the puppy dog is playing at the foot of the master. And a young monk says to him, does that puppy dog have Buddha nature? Now you see, by that time they had the Lotus Sutra. And the Lotus Sutra, page after page after page after page, it tells you the same thing in many different ways. All people, all things have Buddha nature. All things that live eventually will become Buddha. Even a cockroach will eventually become Buddha. Puppy dogs will become Buddha. That's what Lotus Sutra says. The great monk Chao Chu said, Hum! Now, you know my Vietnamese accent is horrible. 
So the Vietnamese people here have no idea what I just said. But there is a word that kind of sounds like hum, and Michelle will give it to me. How do you say zero in Vietnamese? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, zero. How do you say zero? Zero. You know, come. Yeah, see? Come. I thought it sounded the same. Come. Yeah. How do you say empty? It come too. Ah. Empty. How do you say no? Come. Ah! One word means three things. Look like Vietnamese, uh, black color, they can call three words too. Yeah. Black color, they can say the huyen, uh, mực. Three words, one, one meaning. So, everybody says that Chao Chu said no. Forever, everybody says that. Vietnamese masters, Chinese masters, Korean masters. Japanese masters, they all say, Chao Chu said no. <clears throat> I think they're wrong. I don't think Chao Chu said no. Because this word, which is the same for zero, see the zero? Can you see the zero right there? You see that zero on that? This is a monk's thing. You know what that zero is for? Empty. Empty. It's not for no, it's for empty. You know what empty is? That's who you are when you stop having a dream. When you stop imagining who you are. When you stop trying to be who you think you should be and you are who you are. And so Chao Chu said no, and I said, I think he said empty. But the monk heard no. And the monk goes, wait a minute, my master made me read this sutra ten times. And in that sutra it says everything had Buddha nature. I don't understand. How can you say hum? And Chao Chu just smiled. Oh. Oh. Other sound that the Korean uses is gong. Yeah. Hum, gong, gong. So a week goes by, the young monk who walks around scratches his head a lot, says, I don't understand, I don't understand. See, when he walked up to the great master, he thought he knew everything. He read a book. He thought he knew everything. The great master said, empty. Another monk came up and said to the master, this is an older monk. He's going to test the master. He said, master, does puppy dog have Buddha nature? Master said, why, of course it has Buddha nature. What's the matter with you? This is a very basic thing. You don't understand puppy dog has Buddha nature? And the monk smiled. The purpose of koans or public questions is not the solving of a koan. There is a Zen center in Los Angeles. I, well, I won't name who it is. There's many down there. And they have people do almost 300 koans. And if they cannot figure out the other koan, they give it to them. And they say, next time you come talk to me, this is a disciple, a student, and the master talking private. You give me that answer. And when I think you give it right, then we move on to the next one. Sometimes they work on three and four. They are under the delusion that you have to solve, I, th I forget what it is, it's like 278 koans. The Blue Cliff Record has 100 in it. Okay, that's the one Dogen brought back, 100 problems. You cannot be fully ordained, you cannot get yellow robe as monk, you cannot be Watum, you cannot be big shot unless you solve all these koans. They got confused. The koans are not about solving anything. You take a mathematics class, that's about solving problem. You study a koan, that's about knowing who you are. One day, when I was first year, the first year, my teacher had died two years before. When I went to him, I said, I am a monk, but I'm not done. I need to be trained. And he said, 
everybody here will be jealous if I accept you at your level. You must start over. I said, no problem. I already had a temple. He make me a sai, a beginner monk, over again. I said, fine, no problem. I don't care. You just train me. In 82, he died. In 82, I cried. I lost my master. I wasn't with him very long. I was working in our garden. I thought, I go study with this Japanese master. I won't say who he is. I don't want to hurt the feelings of his disciples. But he was an alcoholic. He did some bad things. I thought, he's the only one I know that I could go study with. My master and him were good friends. If you know anything, you can figure it out, but I won't tell you. And I thought to myself as I worked in the garden, I need to finish. I'm not done. I may have a cake, but I got no frosting on it. I got to finish this up. And one of my friends came to visit and spend the night. And he said, hey, did you know that the master, yes, last week he got up in front of all his disciples, his monks and his lay disciples, and he told them, I am an alcoholic. I have done bad things. I now have joined Alcoholics Anonymous. I promise you that I will try to do better. And I had an awakening. A friend of mine, I saw him on YouTube talking about enlightenment. I thought that was the silliest thing I ever heard. I want to tell you about enlightenment. I'm not going to tell you about nothing. I let go. At that moment, I understood. I was done. That's all. I have a student by the name of Venerable Wanji who says, oh, you know, you study a koan. There's no rockets in the sky. There's no bells that sound. I think maybe for some people there are. For me, I went back to doing what I was doing. I was weeding in the garden. That was my awakening. But I did realize that I'm OK. Doesn't mean I arrived. It means my feet are on the right path. And as long as I keep my feet on that path, everything will be OK. And we say the name of the Buddha because it's a special name. So when we greet each other, instead of saying hello, we say Amida Buddha. Or sometimes Shakyamuni Buddha. Or sometimes Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. It's a good thing to say as we bow to our Buddha nature.